Lord Robert Stewart, mounted on a fresh grey stallion, pushed his way towards the front of the Scottish left wing. They'll have few arrows left, he promised his men. Few arrows! We can break them! His men had so nearly broken the damned English last time. So nearly, and surely another howling rush would obliterate the small, defiant army and open the road to the opulent riches of the south. For St. Andrew! Lord Robert called, and the drummers began their beating. For our king! For Scotland! And the howling began again. Its assault, unlike the first, did not come hard on the heels of fleeing archers. Instead, the archers were drawn up, ready to receive the charge, and this time the arrows flew thicker starlings. Those on the Scottish left, who had so nearly broken the English line, were now faced by twice as many archers, and their charge, which had begun so confidently, slowed to a crawl and then stopped altogether as men crouched behind shields. The Scottish right never advanced at all, while the king's central sheltron was checked fifty paces from the stone wall, behind which a crowd of archers sent an incessant shower of arrows. The Scots would not retreat, they could not advance, and for a time the long shafted arrows thumped onto shields and into carelessly exposed bodies. Then Lord Robert Stuart's men edged back out of range, and the King's Sheltron followed, and so another pause came over the Red Earth battlefield. The drums were sucked, and no more insults were being shouted across the littered pasture land. The Scottish lords, those who still lived, gathered under their King's Saltire banner, and the Archbishop of York, seeing his enemies in council, called his own lords together. The English men were gloomy. The enemy, they reasoned, would never expose themselves to what the Archbishop described as a third baptism of arrows. The bastards will slink off northwards, the Archbishop predicted. God damn their bloody souls. Then we follow them, Lord Percy said. They move faster than us, the Archbishop said. He had taken off his helmet, and its leather liner had left an indentation in his hair, circling his skull. We'll slaughter their foot, another lord said wolfishly. Damn their infantry, the archbishop snapped, impatient with such foolery. He wanted to capture the Scottish lords, the men mounted on the swiftest and most expensive horses. It was their ransoms that would make him rich, and he especially wanted to capture those Scottish nobles like the Earl of Menteith, who had sworn fealty to Edward of England, and whose presence in the enemy army proved their treachery. Such men would not be ransomed, but would be executed as an example to other men who broke their oaths. But if the Archbishop was victorious today, then he could lead this small army into Scotland and take the traitors' estates. He would take everything from them, the timber from their parks, the sheets from their beds, the beds themselves, the slates off their roofs, their pots, their pans, their cattle, even the rushes from their stream beds. But they won't attack again, the Archbishop said. Then we shall have to be clever, Lord Arthwaite put in cheerfully. The other lords looked suspiciously at Arthwaite. Cleverness was not a quality they prized, for it hunted no boars, killed no stags, enjoyed no women, took no prisoners. Churchmen could be clever, and doubtless there were clever fools at Oxford, and even women could be clever, so long as they did not flaunt it. But on a battlefield? Cleverness? Clever? Lord Neville.